All right, here we are. We're live. This is totally uncensored. And my guest today is Eddie Brill. Eddie Brill now is not only not only is he an icon, a comedy legend who has rubbed elbows with some of the biggest comedy stars in the game from George Carlin to Richard Pryor to Joe Rivers. And we're going to talk about all of these people and Sam Kittison. Also, Eddie was the stand-up comedy booker for the late show with David Letterman. That's mm -hmm. right. He got to book us. Oh, not me, but, you know, book comedians, let's say, on the show, as well as doing the warm-up act. So, hey, Eddie, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you. Always great to see you, Mike. Always, always, always. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So, first of all, just uh, are you okay? You're staying safe with the whole coronavirus thing going on in New York? Yeah, I'm, I'm staying as sane as I can in this whole Twilight Zone episode that we got going on. And, uh, you know, I was excited I was going to be able to do stand-up finally on the 15th of August. And it just got canceled because people are so worried about it being dangerous for people to be in a place, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, I'm going a little nuts not being able to do stand up. And doing stand up on Zoom is real, or these kind of stream yards, they're not always that really good. You know, they're good for interviews, they're good for storytelling, they're good for chatting. But uh, I miss being in the club. You know, I love that. It's my work right out of my mouth. I mean, I, I, I've been asked to do it, but to me, it's like an art. You know, you have to have that audience and the smell yeah. of the club. And it is it's great like for you have with the crowd. You know, you're going back and forth and, yeah. You know, like an improv with the crowd and their and their rhythms and your rhythms, and you can't do it. It's not as beautiful as without them. Yeah, because I had a couple of open micers ask me. They go, "Hey, do you think it's a good idea to do it?" And I, you know, I said, in my case, you know, I've been doing it so long. It's about image, but maybe for an open micer, it's a good experience. I don't know, but personally, any state I, I wouldn't do good. it. Yeah, any state time's good, but I think it's it's really hard to get laughs online because you're not really you're getting la You know, there's like a you're not getting a whole audience as one, you know, you're getting one person, but, uh, it's, how, it's, long, how long have you been doing stand up comedy yourself? Uh, it's an interesting question because, um, last week it was 36 years in a row wow. that I've been doing. Ooh. I started in college and, and I did, I was, I was doing sketch and improv and then I did a little stand up at the, you know, the end of college toward the end of college and like in around 1981, I quit because I thought that was fun, but you know, I need a real job. And then in 1984, I had the chance to run a comedy club downtown in Manhattan in the village, Paper Moon. And I started comedy at this place. And uh, and then I haven't stopped since I since that day, July 29th, 1984. There you go. All right. So then you, you have the beautiful gig, a dream gig, right? Working there at the Late Show with David Letterman. Yeah. And obviously, like all good things, they must come to an end. So how yeah. did Eddie Brill make the adjustment where no more getting up four or five days a week going to the Ed Sullivan Theater? I know. I the Ed that. Sullivan Theater with a big crowd and David Letterman is there and Paul, what is it, Paul Schaefer is there. Right. And all of a sudden the next night, no more. How did you I know it, it's it's interesting. It's it's you know, there's there was a freedom that I had. The 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 positive, if you want to look for the silver lining. I had the freedom now to be able to travel more, to do films, to do things that I couldn't do when I was at the show because my responsibilities were there. And I loved my responsibilities there. It was all great. Um, but, you know, I got to go on longer trips. I got to, you know, do a lot of corporate gigs that I couldn't leave to go out of town for. Um, but, you know, I, I knew it was coming and I, you know, was ready. I was just, okay, what else am I going to do? I'm not going to sit around and cry. I'm going to, uh, you know, just get back, get on stage. You know, I started, uh, you know, I, I was booking this comedy festival in Nebraska for Johnny Carson. You know, I was booking the Woodstock Comedy Festival and then performing around the world. I started traveling more, you know, I, England, Ireland, Australia. I performed in Bangladesh, Paris. Well, you know, it's like it was dream come true. As a little boy, I always dreamed to travel. It was my big dream. And then uh, and, and eventually in my life, people paid me to do just that. You know, it was nice. That's awesome. Really, then, really cool. It is. It is. Uh, now, do you keep in touch with David Letterman? Does he call? You call him? Do you still have a relationship? You know, it's or? interesting. Most uh, we keep the staff keeps in touch. We're all in the band, the, you know, Alan Coulter, the announcer all the camera people, all the crew. 
I stop by the the theater every once in a while where Colbert is now there, Stephen Colbert, right. and it's the same crew, the CBS crew, there. So you know, we're we're all friends. We go to dinners and all that. But Letterman's kind of you know separated himself. Like I I was having dinner with the director um, recently from the show, and he said. You know, he doesn't really hear from Letterman. And then I talked to some of the executive producers and they don't, you know, so, you know, he he's moved on to the life that he has now. He does this great Netflix show and, you know, he's having more of a family life, which is kind of nice for him. So I think that's where he is at. But there's no like, hey, Eddie, how you doing? Come on over. You know, I don't, I don't have that. No. <laughs> All right. Now, well, what are some of your most memorable moments on that show? Well, it's just the meeting of so many people. You know, when I was a little boy, I had a poster of Sophia Loren in my room. She was the greatest actress. She was beautiful. She was just represented, just a strength. I loved Italian women. And uh, and I met her there, and she couldn't have been more graceful and beautiful and lovely to me. I sat on the piano bench with Burt Bacharach, and we he was playing the piano and telling me stories. And I told him when I was a kid, I did a whole bunch of songs of his and called it Back to Bacharach. And he was like, oh, what a great idea, you know? I mean, I met, I sat with James Brown, my hero, for like 20 minutes and had, you know, stories. I sat with him in the green room. No one else was in there. I was sitting in there. He walked in and he said, hey. And then I was like, I have a million, I love you and I have a million questions. And I mean, on and on, you know, I met Don Rickles there and became friends with him. And uh, it was just amazing, you know, there's, a, and. The one one story that I remember, which is crazy, um, the actress Sarah Michelle Geller, um, and she's a terrific actress, and she was a guest on our show. And when when the guests would come out, I was on Letterman's left, right, not right, on his left. Right. And uh, the guests would come out, and as they made their way on the stage, they could easily see me. And if they knew me, they would say hello. And I didn't know her; I never met her. But she like looked at me like, "Oh, hey, how are you?" And I was like, "Hmm." And then at the end of the show, she came up to me and asked me how I was doing. And I was like, I'm fine. How are you? And then she gave me a nice big hug and, and took off. And I'm like, wow, that was nice. What a nice person. And Dave goes, how do you know her? And I go, I don't. I never met. He goes, he started laughing. He's like, what do you mean? It seemed like your best friends. I go, I think she thinks I'm somebody else. I don't remember. I don't know. So the next time she came on the show, the same thing happened. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? And I was like, I'm good. How's... Your husband, you know, Freddie Prince Jr., she's married to, and because he's, I love Freddie Prince, and you know, it's all the stuff. And she gave him a big hug and took off, and Letterman was laughing. And it happened a couple of more times, you know. And finally, like the fifth time or so she was on the show, she uh, came on the show and she didn't acknowledge me. And she just okay. left when she was done. She didn't look angry, mm -hmm. but I was, Dave and I were wondering, it's like, um, did she realize? the mistake that I wasn't the person that she thought I was, or maybe she was in a bad mood or, you know, we don't know. Uh, she was very lovely, but right. it was kind of a funny situation. It was like, I kind of missed my hug and <laughs> chat with Sarah Michelle Geller. You know, those are, those are celebrities for you. You don't know <laughs> from one day to the other, what they're thinking or what right. they're smoking, but no, who, <laughs> who, who was your most difficult guest? I don't have to say the meanest, but the most difficult way you said, mm, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's hard for me to want to talk about that because, you know, I mean, it's, it's difficult, you know, not, not the mean, it's just who was a little yeah. you know, in a bad mood that day. No, you know, very rarely did people do that. A lot of people said bad things about people and these, and they turned out to be wrong. I remember I had heard that Rich Little, the impressionist was very hard to work with or whatever. And I was kind of, I had to work with him because we were doing, he was doing, you know, uh, impressions on the show. And he couldn't have been nicer. He was the nicest, one of the nicest people of all the people that came there. Not only was he nice to me before the show, during the show, afterwards he sent me a beautiful card. Mm -hmm. And just, it was just a, so, you know, a lot of times people say, I remember Whitney Houston, people were like, oh, she's a troublemaker. She's in love with herself, whatever. She was the nicest person on the planet. Sweet, loving, talk to everyone, the crew, you know, the, the people on the show. She, you know what I mean? So that to me is more interesting than, you know, who was an asshole, you know. There's very few people were and not really worth. Well, let me ask you, because who I found strange, unless it was an act, do you remember Joaquin, what's his name? Joaquin, the guy who played the Joker, Joaquin. Oh, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. Was he really like that or was it an act? 
I think, well, the, the night of that he was on the show, I think he was playing a character for, they were making a film. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, and I think he was in character. And I don't think he, he didn't tell the producer that he was going to do that. And Letterman caught on right away and started playing with him. And oh, okay. they had, and, and he, Letterman had fun. And he, you could see him crack a smile because oh. Letter, Letterman was on. And then when the segment was over, he was his regular self. So, oh. you know, um, they were, the audience didn't see that, but he was his regular self. He, so was, so he was, was a very nice guy and a good guest and okay. very so, intense, good actor, you know. So it was, it, it was role playing then. Yeah. Oh, they got me good with that one. All right. So now we know that you were the uh, stand up comedy talented booker. So, how did a comedian at that time, what was the process for a comedian to get a guest uh, an appearance? on the late show with David Lennon. Well, there weren't that many spots and there was a lot of regulars that were on the show and we'd have to put them on every year, like Brian right. Regan, you know, one of Dave's favorites and, you know, that kind of thing. But I was uh, constantly traveling the, the world as a comic and I'd you know, see, all, you know, I'd do auditions for comics and there was a certain kind of comic that was right for Letterman's show. It was more like a, you know, more like smart and silly. It was, you know, like, a, like Jake Johansson or Brian Regan, as mentioned you know, Wendy Liebman, you know, those kind of comics. And uh, so, you know, but we got to, I got to some of the classic people like George Carlin to do the show and Robert Klein and Roseanne Barr, you know, some of, like Larry Miller. I got some of the great classic comics to come back and do it because, you know, I remember as a kid and I watched the Tonight Show and I saw these comics on the show and I want to be like these people. And so I was hoping that by putting on classics, as well as the newer comics and the regulars that we had on the show, um, you know that the young com some young comic somewhere was watching the Letterman show that night and was inspired by that comedian and then ended up doing comedy. Okay, so now you've been doing it a long time. I know you have a, I think a, a master stand up class, which I wish I could even attend. Doing it after twenty five years, it's fun. It's a it's a workshop. You know, yeah, you work well. together with everybody, and it's beautiful. I'm very yeah. proud of it. And I'm sure there's a lot to learn, even at my stage, probably would learn something. I so learn what, something new every time. No, yeah, that's true. So my question is like, what is the best advice you can give for a young and up, you know, comedian coming up today, like as far as starting that path of stand-up comedy? Because we're in 2020 now, it's a different game, you know? Yeah, well, you know, the COVID thing makes it hard to, to do it. The key really is to just get on stage often. Get on stage, get on stage. That's the best teacher. There's no better teacher in the world than stage time. And, and that's what I recommend the most. And to constantly be writing and jotting notes and taking, you know, putting ideas and trying them on stage. And also st sticking to your truth, finding your truth and then just and sticking to it and not listening to other people who are telling you you have to be this kind or this type. You know, you have to be yourself. You have to be your most authentic self. And, and that you know, that how is how comics are. And, you know, at the beginning, I am as guilty as anybody. I'd say 99% of the comedians at the beginning of their career are acting like a comedian because you have your favorite stand-ups or your favorite performers. And you, and like, I love George Carlin. So I would be, my things were rhythmically like George, you know, I would talk like him a lot. And uh, eventually I, you know, got rid of all of the everything else and just was me. But, you know, the only person I really saw come out like gangbusters and just tell his truth was Chappelle. He just, you know, was a young kid, he, you know, sort of like Bill Hicks in a way as yeah. well. They they came out, they told their truth. <clears throat> they weren't trying to please the audience with, you know, trying to be to make the audience happy. I mean, they wanted the audience to be happy and it's important to do that. That's another thing that I've learned and I would pass on to comedians. <clears throat> Tell your truth and don't try to please people, you know, because it's not that uh, it's not that sexy. It's not that attractive. You know, if you stand up for who, what you are and who you are and what you believe in and whatever warped sense of person you might be, I think the audience appreciates that and it's much more alluring. That's true. Now, I'm just curious, Eddie, I don't know if you've ever counted, but how many hours of material would you say you have? It's hard to say. You know, I've thrown away hours of stuff over the years. You know, at the beginning, I had all this material and I don't I couldn't even remember it. Some someone yelled out, hey, do the yellow pages bit. And I went, I don't remember it. And it was a bit I did on Dr. Katz and 
I told the guy in the audience, you, do you remember? He says, yes. And he like, he made me realize what the bit was again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, these days, just before COVID hit in the middle of March, I was writing so much new stuff and playing on stage and ad-libbing. It was so, so good. And I was on such a roll. And uh, so it's a shame that that gets halted. But you know what? It's what it is. And now I... Go, I'll go out there and uh, next uh, when I can and set it up and knock it down the same way. But hours, I don't know how to. I know that I have probably a couple of hours that I know that I love. Right, right. And then you know uh, stuff that I tossed. I, I've forgotten more than I've kept. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you remember because you said someone says, "Hey, do you ever book? Uh, you ever play this bit?" You don't remember, but I don't know if you remember. I opened up for you. In New Jersey, mm -hmm. I drove from the Bronx where I lived. You know, I was like great open mic, whatever, whatever, doing it like a year. You know, but I picked you up. You're the headliner. We drive to Jersey, and I don't know if you remember this bit, but you close with your Tom Jones bit. Oh wow, that came from an ad lib one I night. You had like a tissue paper, and you started. Yeah, it was hang it to this. Man. You all to be happy with anyone. <laughs> I don't. You know, I was. I remember was I was working hilarious. in Albany, New York million years ago and I was sweating and I took the handkerchief out and then I just went off on this ad lib about Tom Jones because I loved Tom Jones. Tom Jones was one of my heroes. His show was fantastic and not only was his show great for music and he was an incredible singer but he had a lot of comedy on his show. He put Pryor on, Richard Pryor on the show right. and he didn't, he didn't ask Richard to hold back. Richard really was able to do Richard Pryor comedy. He had, you know, he had a comedy group on the show, uh, you know, he, he, he was a, it, Tom Jones show was a great show. So, um, you know, and the, luckily eventually I got to meet Tom Jones a couple of times okay. and that was a big thrill for me. Wow. Well, that gets me to where you have crossed paths with some of the greats. So <laughs> I want to get to the juicy part here. Tell me about what's, you, you come across with some great people. Joan Rivers, what was she like? Well, I was working at Stand Up New York one night with three other comics, and they used to put four comics every night for the whole week. And uh, after the show was over, the four of us were hanging out, and Joan Rivers was there. And we sat with her, and we spoke for like an hour, and we're telling stories, and she was great. Well, years later, I was working in Milwaukee, and it was about a year, it was 1997, because I know, because I was doing my first appearance on The Letterman Show. And I saw her at the same uh, gate that I was in Milwaukee heading to New York. So I, I was a little nervous, but I went up to her. I go, I don't know if you remember. We were all at a table, blah, blah, blah. She goes, yeah, I remember. I don't remember everyone's names, but I remember that night. It was fun. And I said, yeah, I'm excited. I was just working in Milwaukee. She says, so was I. And she was doing a theater, and I was doing Comedy Cafe, which is a great venue. And uh, I told her how great it was, and it was so down to earth, the club, and I'm doing Letterman in the, a week and a half or whatever. She goes, oh, that's fantastic. And I say, yeah, it's my first appearance. And um, so I'm on the plane, and I'm, we were heading to New York, and Joan gets up during the flight and taps the lady next to me and says, do you mind switching seats with me? And the lady said, sure. And then Joan sat next to me. She goes, all right, let me hear it. And I go, here, watch. She goes, let me hear you, the set you're going to do on Letterman. Wow. And I went through the set, and she was helpful in every way possible, and especially telling me how important the nonverbal stuff was. It wasn't; it shouldn't be word, 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 word. It was, you know, use nonverbal means. And she pointed out that Jack Benny got his biggest laughs on pauses. And you know, when I did my first Letterman set, um, I could I could feel her presence because she definitely affected my set and then years later there was a party at this on the set of saturday night live for the new yorker magazine or new york magazine one of the two and um there was a bunch of celebrities in the audience and i was just emceeing and hosting this event pre-party kind of thing um before you know and doing a little not so much stand-up but just work in the crowd and then some people would come late and i would joke about hey do, you know do, you know didn't you buy a watch and you know that kind of bullshit stuff that we would do and people were laughing and loving it like they'd never heard that kind of stuff before i think people were, were le so many people were coming in late i think some people were like getting up going to the bathroom coming back just so i would make fun of them it just they were really getting into it okay. so now joan rivers comes in and she's a little late and now the crowd looks at her and looks at me like you know all right here we go what are you going to do to joan 
And I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to make you with Joan. And I told them the story of how she helped me with my first set. Okay. And the crowd gave her a standing ovation. Mm. And she was so touched. And it was just a beautiful moment, you know, in time. That's awesome. And you also uh, rubbed shoulders with uh, George Carlin. What was that like, George Carlin? Well, you know, he's my hero and um, him and Pryor. And uh, so, you know, I had a lot of ex fantastic experiences. He called the Letterman show and said, who's that comedian? I think he's very funny. And that's how I got to kind of know him. And I, you know, I also know a couple of other things where there was, I was working in, in this Vegas show thing and he came by, there was other comics and me in the show and he came and was sitting in the audience and my friends were at the booth next to his. And the people with him were talking, talking, talking. And then when I they announced my name, George yelled at his friends, hey, shut up. I really love this guy. I want to watch him. So he, I didn't, you know, it, my friend said, oh my God, George Carlin said he loved you. And so, you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't have to do another comedy again or, you know, have to need any approval. I got my hero likes my comedy and we became friendly and he ended up, calling me and I have the answer machine message, you know, saved where he yeah. called because he wanted me to teach his girlfriend, Sally, to do stand up. And I said, but you're George Carlin. And he goes, she's not going to listen to me. Mm -hmm. But he said, I heard you're the best at this. And I really wanted I want to work hard to work with you. And, you know, to I me, mean, that's the ultimate compliment that, that's you awesome. know, so, you know, like a dream come true. I'm, you know, over the moon, as they say, uh, for right. Because my hero thought I was funny, you know, it's great. No, that's a that's a credit I would use for my my stand up class. George Carlin quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That Richard Pryor, you said you mentioned you booked into. Well, Richard I was Pryor. at the comedy store. I was at the comedy store in L.A. and he would come in, you know, occasionally and do stand up, and it was, you know, it was a thrill. We'd all run to watch him. But one night, I'm on stage in the original room, and they handed me a note, and I looked at the note and I said, "When you're done, bring up Richard Pryor." And I was like, <sighs> I like couldn't breathe. What year was this? Um, late eighties. Okay. You know, eighty seven, eighty something like that, around eighty seven or so. I don't remember exactly. It was late eighties, and uh, and <clears throat> so they hand me the note, and I'm like, ah, you know, and my brain is like swirling, and I, I just finished the bit, you know, by the grace of God, I got through the bit, and then I said, ladies and gentlemen, our next comic, because uh, you would just. You go. It was piggyback. You would bring up the next comic. You would just bring up whoever was next, and they bring up the next, and it was like that. And uh, and I said Richard Pryor, and the crowd didn't believe me. You know, they were like, "Yeah, right." And but you saw him walking through the crowd, and as, as he was walking through the crowd, all of a sudden you heard the cheers started building and building. And then when he got to the stage, it was deafening because they couldn't believe Richard Pryor showed up, and he wow. he shook my hand, grabbed the mic and said, nice job, kid. And, you know, that's, again, he could have said mashed potatoes and sauce and I would have been thrilled, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Richard Pryor just talking to me was so good. Amazing. And what, what was the comic strip like in the 80s compared to today? I mean, is there a comparison? Like well, you know, the comic strip, though, you know, in New York, I was running a comedy club, and a lot well, the of the comedy, other, comedy store. I'm well, the comedy store, yeah, the yeah. comedy store in the '80s was spectacular. I mean, they have three rooms in the building: uh, the original room, the seats, I guess, 180, 200. They have the belly room, which seats about 60, and then the main room was about 300. So it was packed. All the rooms were packed during that era, and all the greatest comics on the planet were coming in to come either hang out or go and do stage time. And I was a regular there. I lived, Mitzi Shore, who, Paul, Paulie Shore's mother, ran the place, was very kind to me, and she put me up in uh, two different locations right behind the comedy store. So the comedy store was my living room. You know, I would get out, I had lived in this little shack for a while, and then I lived in the Errol Flynn house, uh, and, you know, Sandy Shore, um, the daughter, lived there as well, and and she just was kind enough to put me up. I didn't have a place to stay, and she put me up. And and then every night I just hang out at the in the comedy store, and it was just, you know, there Roseanne's on, and there's Louis Anderson, and there's you know Harry Dean Stanton is actors in the audience, and then there's porn stars, and they're in the audience. And, you know, it's just 
surreal. Then, you yeah. know, there would be a party afterwards and Kinnison would throw a little bash and be Sean Penn would be there and John Bon Jovi. And, wow. you know, it would be a mix of, it was just crazy. You know, it was just like, it was, uh, you know, but the weird thing is there was a lot of drugs and a lot of booze and a lot of partying, which was great. I, I don't regret any of it. I had a lot of fun, but I had to get out of there. And by 1990, I was like, I told Kinnison, look, I appreciate all the help you've given me, but I've got to, I got to get away because I got to stop. Well, that's, what, that's where I want to get to next. You and Sam Kennison became very close. And like you said, you had a, he party so hard, you had to go back to New York. Yeah. It was, we were <laughs> so how, how, how did you and Sam Kennison meet? How did you get involved in partying together? And tell me a little bit about those parties. Well, the, the, the second night I was in L.A., um, I was I did the Monday night show, which was the big show. It was audience, free audience. They'd come in, and you'd all do like 10 minutes and be like, you know, 30 comics on or whatever. And Kinnison would close the show, and he was just spectacular. The genius would always come up with new stuff all the time. All the comics, we just were couldn't wouldn't leave until, until we watched them. But the first night I'm at the comedy store and I go on and I do a 10 minute set and I think it's okay, you know, uh, it's just my stuff. I'm not a genius or anything, I'm doing my 10. When I was done, uh, Alan Steven, who was part of Kinnison's, you know, closest circle, came up to me and uh, said, hi, you know, um, Alan, very funny sh set. Sam would like to meet you, he thinks you're really funny. I was like, okay. So we go backstage and there was Sam like sitting on a throne, you know, kind of thing. And he had, you know, a woman on both sides of him. And he's, you know, there's all these celebrities back in the backstage area. And he said, yeah, you're very funny. I want you to party with us tonight. You know, come join us. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, that was like the first night. And it was kind of interesting because he was really into the work and he was not just into partying. He was really into the work and he liked the comedians who really did the work. And he had a group of guys that were his main guys. And it was this Alan Steven and Mitchell Walters and a few others. But there was an, a second tier of younger guys. And I was one of them and Jimmy Schubert, the great Jimmy Schubert and, uh, and hilarious Stephen Pearl. And a couple other people, Larry Scarano, we were like the younger guys that Kinnison was like, had the, we were like his farm team. Then he looked out for us. And I became very close with uh, Kinnison's brother, Kevin. And, you know, he was just an amazing guy. And we, it was like family, you know, Kinnison treated me like family. And even when I left LA, Kinnison, I would get calls. You have a gig for you, and it's a lot of money. I'm like, huh? How did I get this gig? And they said Kinnison called us and told us to book you. You know, he was very good to me. But you know, we like the, his birthday was December seventh, Pearl Harbor Day, and he would rent out a music studio because he was a musician, a great guitar player, and so were most of his friends. And I played some instruments and sang a lot. I would Kinnison's band would play, and I would sing some of the songs. You know, and be in front of the band of these incredible people and so one night it was one of his birthday parties and we're in the you know the valley or whatever you call it at this huge loft area the recording studio and we're all jamming and i'm playing the i'm so high i'm playing percussion i've never played percussion in my life and uh you know <laughs> i don't know how i did it and billy idol walks in and he and they, he had just come up with Moni Moni which wasn't his original song, but he had Tommy James and the Shondells, the original, but he did a version. Oh, you're getting a call? I'm good. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, so so and we, we, uh, during the party, there would be breaks and the band wouldn't be playing. And I'm upstairs. It's me, Kinnison, and Billy. And they break out a bag of the you know cocaine and they just make the biggest line in the world. And the three of us split it. And I've never been so high in my life. And now we're singing again. And I'm like, you know, doing the whole mouth all we used to say that was miss it the that oh, was mr oh, ed with the sound turned down if you remember oh. mr ed he'd be like you know <laughs> move his mouth like that and uh it was just it was fun and i almost died that night driving home mm -hmm. yeah and i that was the last time i did any cocaine you know 1989 i think it was uh um but you know i had so much fun i would like i said kenison would have to throw these parties and it would be an eclectic group of some of the greatest musicians, actors, comedians, porn stars in the world. And uh, 
here we are all hanging out together, just laughing, having a good time, drinking, partying, smoking, token, you know. Do you, oh. think, do you yeah. think today that could ex would exist? Like, for example, like, uh, who are some of the comedy people regulars? Like, let's say Bill Burr and Joe Rogan and uh, and whoever you want to that list get together and just have coke parties and go crazy. And have yeah, I don't think people party like that anymore. I think they're funny, smarter. Right? I think they're smarter than we were, you know, they were like, look, the craft, you don't, you know, that's one of the reasons why I left LA because, you know, I, I cared about stand up. It was my baby, you know, it was my, it was my lover <laughs> and I, I wanted to treat it beautifully. And by doing the drugs, although I never did it before I went on stage, it affected me in a way where I wasn't, you know, I wasn't as sharp as I could have been. Well, I'll be honest. I mean, this is 2020. I would not mind a porn star in the audience. That's all yeah, I'm, uh, the, I'm sure. Oh, there's there's more. More. I'm sure there's at least one watching us right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Make a comment. All right. So that gets me to know you. You live in New York, so obviously both coasts, East Coast, West Coast. You know what it's about, comedy-wise. Mm -hmm. Comedians, how are they different? West Coast comics versus East Coast comics. It was mostly. It was you know it's. All comics are, all the great comics are great comics, whether they're in San Antonio or they're in Houston, which are two great comedy towns. Austin, again, great comedy town. Or if they're Chicago, New York, LA. But the difference were the scenes. In LA, there were a lot of movie cameras and a lot of actors wanted to get stage time to be seen by the casting directors. And they knew that a lot of these casting directors would come to the comedy store or the improv in LA or the Laugh Factory eventually when they opened up. And uh, so, you know, so what they would do is they'd put together an act and even if they stole it from other comics, they would, and not all of them were thieves, but you'd get a lot of them. At, Cause they want, you know, it was cutthroat to these people and they wanted to get on stage. And that was it where I felt New York and maybe I'm just prejudiced because I love New York so much. It was a more soulful scene where people really cared about the stand-up and treated the other stand-ups better. Like when we get the light means, all right, get the, you know, you have a minute left or two minutes left and get off the stage. In New York, we respected the light right. and we'd get off stage because, you know, it's better for the next comic. It's better for the whole show. You know, like if you, if each comic was two minutes past the light by the 10th comic, you're 20 minutes later than you should have been on the show. That's right. In LA, people didn't respect the light or the other comics as much as they did in New York. And it was really frustrating. Even comics who weren't, like if a comic was famous, like say Pryor came in, you didn't care. You didn't let him go for six hours. You didn't right, care. Right, right. But if some up and coming person who, or just because they might have had a, some kind of appearance on a TV show or something, they think they're this big star and they go on for an extra 15 or 20 minutes, it was disrespectful uh, to the other right. comics. and. I, I, that was disconcerting to me that these comics wouldn't respect the craft or their fellow comedians. Right. Now, obviously, I want to ask you about like 80s, 80s comedians versus today comedians. What is the difference between them? I don't, as, I don't, far as, as far as maybe respecting a light or expecting immediate success, you know what I'm saying? I think a lot of the comics today are handcuffed by, you know, the situation where you 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 know the cancel culture and you you know politically incorrect because there was a there was a different time and you know you would do comedy that you thought was funny and silly and you did you know you just that was what you grew up on and right. then all of a sudden you know you realize later that you know that's kind of weak comedy and it's punching down and it's not great so you evolve as a comedian you become better at it and write better jokes right. um, well, the comedy scene is going to change, though, I think. In other words, like, you take uh, Sam Kedison, yourself, I mean, where you can say whatever you want. Yeah. You know, let's say 10 years from now, it's like, nope, 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 nope. Yeah. I mean, what is going to see a stand-up show going to be like? I'm not going to say it's not going to be funny, but is it going to be really authentic? Are we going to well, hear it? The you key know? is, hopefully, there'll be enough people that are authentic. And there are, like, you know, Chappelle gets a lot of grief, you know, from his specials because of what he does. But he's not apologizing for it because that's who he is. And that's his perception of, you know, life and his truth. And, you know, you just have to remember, again, we're not here to please people. Like, right. if you please people, that's beautiful. 
But that's not our job. Our job is to tell our truth. So if our truth makes people uncomfortable, you know, and it's not, you know, I mean, there's, it's a, it's a hard line to, to really, I mean, there are certain things we shouldn't do. Like I remember years ago, I had a joke, you know, kind of a funny thing about fake breasts. And I thought it was funny. And I actually, you know, did it and people respected it and thought it was a good joke. And, and then nowadays, you know, someone said to me, so it was talking about, not about the joke, but about, you know, a lot of women have breast cancer and then they, you know, and it's a very sensitive subject. And I was like, hmm. So, you know, I would think nowadays, if I, I haven't done the joke, I don't remember the joke, mm-hmm. but if, uh, the whole piece, but um, if I, I probably wouldn't do it nowadays because I think, you know, I'd be more sensitive to people who have issues or, you know, legitimate, you know, issues with the way they are. But at the same time, if I wrote a joke and I thought it was really funny, I would do it. Okay. You know, that's that's the difference. Do you think Richard Pryor today would have been received well, would have made it? I mean, you know, Richard Pryor, just Richard Pryor, he's going to be you. Do you think they would have just trashed him on Twitter where the most offensive comic or? They, they have might have, but they would have been wrong. Oh, yeah? yeah? Yeah, because he was just pure vulnerability he he that he was the strength he would he would show you the human element the human condition uh, through the characters that he did and he just told the truth and he was very smart and very funny and also very silly and also you know just a great guy who you know would light up the screen whether it be in a movie with gene wilder or him doing stand up at the sunset strip or you know whatever you know so I think that you know, there's a few icons that you wouldn't have to change anything they did. Right. Yeah, I went to George Carlin the other night, and there was a a joke in from 1966, like I think his first TV appearance on the Jimmy Dean show, and uh, he comes out and he did some bit about you know, like the news, and he was doing a fake news thing, and not fake news like today, but you know, like he was pretending he was the anchor person. And he read some story about some Hollywood couple that were breaking up and the, you know, the guy had married the woman and had three kids and she was 16 or 15. And the joke was more about the fact that she had three kids at that age. And, you know, it was silly and it got laughs, but I think people might bristle at that kind of joke nowadays, but you know, um, I was talking to my brother and he was like, yeah, no, it's a funny joke. And, uh, mm-hmm. and we get it and we know it's a joke and we know that he's kidding and we, we understand the, the essence. It's really the, you know, it's, it's, what's the essence of the joke and what, what's your, um, what's your intent? I think that's right. the key word. So what's your intent? If your intent is to be an asshole, then you're an asshole and you shouldn't be, you should get shit for it. Right. You know, unless you're really a funny asshole, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you now. I noticed on your feed there's a lot of going back and forth as far as Donald Trump. Right. right? I don't I talk about I, that I, on, on stage. Right. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I understand that. But I guess my question is, like, for me, <laughs> I used to do it. I stopped because I realized I lost a lot of friends or so-called friends. Right. So what is your situation when you put up a Trump post? Are you losing friends? Uh, in other words, is there a division where you're losing friends that used to be friends? Nah, I, you know, not, no, because I have friends that um, like him. I don't understand it, but, uh, you know, we're New Yorkers. We right. know we knew Trump before they did. And, right. you know, if people think of Trump as, you know, he, they think he's that TV guy. From the, he th- a successful businessman because they saw him on the reality show The Apprentice, right. but they don't know that he's not a successful businessman, and and uh, you're not going to tell him any different. You know, it's like you're watching the the Housewives of San Diego, and you're thinking these stories are mostly real and and that this <laughs> is their lives, and you know, and then you're like, yeah, you know, some people will be like, you know, Susie, did you hear what happened to her on the show? And they invest their lives in it. Well, the same thing with Trump. People invest their lives in this guy, and. And, you know, and I understand, and I have a lot of friends who are conservative, uh, you know, human beings, and we have a great friendships, and we can joke about everything. And so the people that if I lost someone who didn't, you know, 
I would think that they weren't really a, a great friend okay. to begin with because right. you know you could have a debate. You right. might not, you're not going to agree. Some right. people are going to like, you know, um, you know, Herbert Hoover, and somebody's going to like, you know, w Willard Fillmore or whatever, right. Right. and you're not going to agree. And sometimes, you know, but as long as someone is compassionate and passionate mm -hmm. about other human beings, like if someone doesn't want to give health care to human beings, that to me makes me sad. You know, why wouldn't you want someone to be able to have the best health care in the world? And, you know, but some people really don't believe that that should happen, that people, you know, and so that that's a little bit of a bummer. And if some, a good friend of mine felt that way, I'd think, you know what, I don't know if that person is really someone I'd want to hang out with, someone who's not compassionate to others. Right. You know, but that's because I grew up in a house where we were very poor. We had no money. I worked like three jobs. And my stepfather died and I had to work. And there was a time in our lives that we needed food stamps and we used them as a bridge to get us to a place where we can afford, you know, we all worked and was able to afford it, but it was all little children. You know, I raised my three brothers and sister and they were all children. I was 15 raising kids. So the, my mom was embarrassed by the food stamps. So I would have to go to the store with the food stamps and, and purchase it. But thank God, they were there or there was a Baptist church we weren't part of, but they were in our neighborhood and they were the loveliest. They looked after the kids. They brought us turkeys at Thanksgiving. You know, I mean, there was a lot of community that was beautiful and yeah. it, you didn't have to be part of the church or you didn't have to be, you know, but if you're going to spend the rest of your life on food stamps, then, and you're not going to try to work, then you're a jerk. Yeah. But, you know, I, so, so that's where I stand. You know, as a human being, I stand in a very compassionate place. Okay. Life is short. And if you bring negativity to the such situation, it's going to be negative. And if you bring and I'm guilty of it every once in a while, I get so mad at people sometimes and their lack of love for others and, and that I get angry about it. And then I'm defeating my own purpose. But I, I, I'm willing to be getting a debate with someone. And hopefully at the end of it, we're still going to be friends. Well, that would be nice. And how do you feel? Like, I know I've gotten that a lot, a, a lot myself, where, you know, we're comedians and people will say to you, well, you have, a, you have a comment, an opinion, let's say, on Trump or politics. And someone says to you, hey, Eddie, bro, stick to comedy. Yeah, well, that's ridiculous. What do you, what do you, you know what I'm saying? What do you tell someone like that? Someone's like, we don't have an opinion. We have no thoughts. As a matter of fact, you know, comedians throughout history have you know, have had some of the best opinions of life and comedian and po politicians. Funny though, I say call them comedians. Um, you know, you go to, you know, some of the greatest comedians. I like, I wanted to hear what Johnny Carson had to say, or I wanted to hear what Bill Hicks or George Carlin had to say about life. I th think that comedians are the truth tellers and that's right. the, and so you want to hear what a comedian has to say, but I also want to hear what, uh, you know, the, you know, the guy who works down at the, the processing plant, if he has yeah. an opinion, you know, I, I don't care, you know, but to say stick to what you're doing, that's just rude, arrogant, and, and, you know, someone who doesn't have any compassion for others. Right. I think it was like Laura Ingram on Fox right. when she told LeBron James, stick to basketball. He yeah, right. Like, Keep dribbling or whatever. And to that kind of a person is a really, you know, there's, there's a real sadness and a negativity to that kind of person. And that kind of person doesn't bring any, there's, there's no solutions. There's just more friction, more anger, more, um, ne more right. negativity. And no one wins. Right. When you have that kind of scenario, right. you have Laura Ingram's situation, she's, you know, like she was talking about hydrochloroquine, like she knew that that would be the thing. And then and the sales when people bought it like crazy because she said right. that people trust her and right. they don't realize that she's just a game show host. Right. You know, she, you know, right. she's just a, a cartoon character who, you know, is acting outraged or acting a certain way. And it's kind of sad. But there are people right. who would hear me right now and go, "Yeah, but she knows, and you don't know." And oh, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a lot of hate mail now for this one. Uh, gonna, yeah, yeah, your Facebook page yeah. is yeah. gonna it's gonna blow up right now. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think Oscar Wilde talking about comedians and having opinions. I think there was Oscar Wilde. I can't remember the line, but he said something like, "It's funny how 
the politicians are now sounding more like comedians and the comedians are now sounding more than politicians, something That's like very that. Very true. And uh, yeah, I think, I think it's a great line. Well, Eddie, where can people find you? They want to know more about Eddie Brill. Where should they go? Well, I'm, I'm getting a new website of a good friend of mine. It's going to be eddiebrill.com, B-R-I-L-L, E-D-D-I-E. And, uh, but on, you can go to uh, Instagram, Eddie Comic, E-D-D-I-E-C-O-M-I-C, Eddie underscore Brill at Twitter. And I'm on Facebook, but, you know, you could just come and say hi there. It's pretty filled up over there. But, um, yeah, you can find me in a lot of places. And always uh, hanging out with Mike Robles, you know. All right. Very cool. We've known each other a long time. It's uh, A long, long time, man. The minute you said, let's do it, I went, all right, let's do it. And I appreciate you very much. And I appreciate everything that you've done as far as, you know, the game. And I learned so much from you, Eddie Brill. And I want to thank you for that. And thank you for being also on the podcast. I really, I really appreciate My that. Because you have a big heart and you're a great guy. And I'm so happy that you're still with us and kicking it. And, you know, so it, yeah. it's a real pleasure to just, just chat, you know, and hang out. Likewise. Thank you. You made my night. You made my night. And thank you for everybody who's tuned in. I'm Mike Robles, totally uncensored. You can catch us on your favorite podcast platform. And uh, you all have a good night, as they say in Texas. Good night. <laughs> Take care, Eddie. It's my pleasure, brother. <laughs>